Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Neighborhood Services District's three and four virtual community meeting. I am Sandy Pantoja, your Neighborhood Services Coordinator for Districts three and four. If you have any neighborhood related questions, please feel free to contact me at any time at 714-765-4635 or by email at espantoja at anaheim.net. Before we get started, if you need a Spanish interpretation, please click on the globe icon located at the bottom right of your Zoom screen and choose Spanish. If you are using your smartphone, simply click on the three dots on the bottom right side and choose interpretation. Si necesitas servicios de interpretación al español, favor de oprimir el botón con la imagen del globo localizado en el lado inferior derecho de su pantalla y elija español. Si está usando su teléfono inteligente, favor de hacer clic en los tres puntos en el lado inferior derecho de su pantalla. Neighborhood Service District community meetings, community meetings are a part of the neighborhood, Anaheim Neighborhood Improvement Program that assists residents to improve the livability of their neighborhoods by enabling them to help themselves through the creation of partnerships with the city and other stakeholders. When the COVID-19 pandemic started last year, we produced pre-recorded videos with important updates, now bringing you these Zoom webinars. We hope you find them useful and informative. However, we hope to see you in person in the next coming months. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use a Q&A feature on the bottom of the screen and we will do our best to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Let's dive into our agenda. First, Sergeant Lillemoyne with the Central Community Policing Team will provide us with an update on current crime trends in Central Anaheim and crime prevention tips. Sergeant Lillemoyne, please proceed with your updates. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, I'm Sergeant Lillemoyne. I'm from the Central District Community Policing Team. And thank you for all taking time to be with us here tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of trends that we've been seeing lately. Uh, one of the most prevalent ones is theft of catalytic converters. This is happening all over, all over Southern California and probably beyond, especially in Anaheim. So there's a couple things that you can do to try to prevent these thefts. Uh, typically what happens is they're going to cut the catalytic converter off of your car, take it to some place and recycle the metal. Uh, it, they may be taking it to a place who's legitimate or not. But what you can do is maybe etch your VIN number into your catalytic converter or paint it on the converter as well. Uh, you might also think about installing like a skid, um, a skid plate on the bottom of your vehicle. Uh, or better yet, if you can, park it in a garage or in a well-lit area. If you do happen to have your catalytic converter stolen or any other burglary or anything that happens, please make a report to the Anaheim Police Department. You can make a report easily online by going to anaheim.net and then online services to file a police report. This will help us track the trends and so we will better know where to send our resources and how to deploy them. Um, moving on, fireworks. We're quickly approaching 4th of July and at this time of year we start seeing an increase in the amount of fireworks that are being lit off and typically you're seeing the the ones that shoot up in the sky, those are, are illegal. Uh, the only fireworks that are legal in Anaheim are the safe and sane type. Uh, they're only allowed to be lit off on 4th of July from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And they're not allowed east of the 55 freeway or south of the 91. Um, but if you do see somebody shooting off fireworks, please call the police department. And what is really helpful to us is if you know who is shooting them off or where they're being shot off because we get a lot of calls where somebody might report that fireworks were shot off at say like Harbor and La Palma. And by the time we get there, we can't find out who did it. So if you do know who did it, please call us and give us their name or their address. And you can do that anonymously if you'd like to. You can also do it through an Anaheim Anytime request. And then that will give us a location where we can go out and we can follow up and make contact with those people, uh, educate them on the laws, and the dangers about shooting off those types of fireworks. And also, if you have any information about anybody selling those fireworks, please contact us and let us know so we can take appropriate enforcement action against them. 
Uh, I'm going to touch real quickly on CCRT, and I know Sandra Lozo is going to talk about that in further, but uh, CCRT works, we work very closely with the CCRT team, um, and it really becomes a balance between doing outreach and then enforcement. And typically where the police get involved is when there may be like a trespassing issue or drug use, something that's a criminal in nature. But for the most part, we work side by side with CCRT, allowing them to offer the resources and help homeless individuals into shelters. I wanna remind everybody that National Night Out will be held this year in person. We're gonna do it at La Palma Park. It's gonna be the first Tuesday in August, which is August 3rd, and it will be from 5 to 8 p.m. So we look forward to seeing everybody out there this year. Uh, keep an eye on our social media pages for more information about that as it, as it approaches. And then finally, the last thing that I have is the Anaheim Police Department is currently hiring police officers and lateral police officers. So if you know anyone who's interested in a career in law enforcement, send them over there to us because we're currently hiring. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Lallemon, for that useful information. And real quick, can I just share my information? I forgot to do this about uh, how you can contact us if you have any further questions. Yes, of course, please do. Let's see here. Thank you. So uh, if you have any questions in District 3, you can contact me. I'm Sergeant Mark Lillimon. Here's my phone number. Or if you're down south in District 4, please contact Sergeant Armando Pardo. And there's his email and phone number. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sergeant. If you just joined us, please remember that you can ask a, a question during the meeting by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Next, we have... Sandra Sager with Sandra Lolo, excuse me, with Community Preservation Manager. Sandra? Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening, everybody. I wanted to first provide an update on our Community Care Response Team, or CCRT. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, we did kick off a pilot program January 1st, 2021. And we do have our own uh, city webpage off of our homeless webpage. Uh, to provide additional information on how uh, to get involved or if you know somebody who might need some assistance uh, or just wants to learn more about what we're doing out there. This is our homeless webpage, uh, has a lot of information about our pathways and just to the right of there is that community care response team and you can click on that and get the latest information. Uh, as a reminder, this pilot program was a reimagining on how we interact uh, and bring awareness to addressing homelessness in Anaheim. Uh, we're also looking to do four different goals on this pilot program. The first one uh, was to divert calls for service coming into our police department that are non-emergency, non-criminal related. Uh, people are just naturally uh, calling the police department over the years. And uh, for those that don't have a criminal nexus, we really want to have uh, skilled professionals respond and try and help a little bit more uh, with their expertise in the field uh, with a variety of resources. The community care response team works seven days a week, 14 hour shifts from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. We do have, as you can see, our hotline. It is a live dispatch line during those hours and those shifts. Uh, so we have some of our homeless neighbors that call that hotline when they're looking for shelter or individuals and advocates that are helping to find shelter for uh, their uh, loved ones. So that number is 714-820-9090. And if it's after their shift hours, you can leave a message and they will get to that call the following day. So one of the goals was to divert calls for service coming into our police department. And I can happy to report after the first 160 days, we're on average diverting 30% of our homeless calls that were coming into the police department over to CCRT. This is very helpful uh, as they're the skilled professional team that is made up of outreach workers, nurse practitioners, mental health clinicians, and a plainclothes safety officer, which is there not only to, um, you know, help with safety for the CCRT team, but also for the individuals that were helping, especially in the evening hours. Another goal of ours was this program, pilot program is fully funded through federal grant dollars. 
the Emergency Solutions Grant, and it's very restricted for homeless and COVID. So while we're out there doing outreach and helping, uh, we're also providing information on COVID awareness, whether it be where to get tested, where to get vaccinated, and also um, providing personal protection equipment. This has been really vital. And if we scroll down, we can start to see some of the stats that we've been able to produce where we've actually engaged over 1200 individuals regarding COVID providing awareness and also personal protection equipment. The third goal was obviously with this program is to bring more people off the street into safe and secure housing. Uh, so far we've uh, exceeded 500 street exits, which is averaging 3.3 individuals a day. I can tell you our shelters uh, have skyrocketed with occupancy. We're close to 300 people in our shelters now that would have normally been on our streets. And through that shelter system, we're actually getting people into housing. And what's amazing too is this particular CCRT team so far since January has actually taken 20, over 20 individuals straight from the street into permanent housing situations. And so it's very important that we gather data while we're out in the field. So a lot of these red dots are individuals, some of them multiple individuals that we're staying in touch. You may see some red dots outside our city limits. That's because we're touching them and having them in special facilities, hospitals, and making sure that we're getting them stabilized and bringing them back to a sheltered environment. Um, the other cool thing is we were able to team up with Andy Nagal and their team of community development with our data to really match housing with the population on the street. We completed the El Verano project in December of 2020, and we were able to process 50 formerly homeless seniors from our shelters into that now permanent supportive housing facility, which is actually in District 3, right next to Rockwood Apartments off of Lincoln and East, which is also next to Lincoln Elementary. So now we have families and seniors uh, assisting and helping out and partnering with our school system, which is a great combination on that street. Again, we continue to match resources and housing. We have a motel conversion project coming on board in a couple months uh, on the west side of town, the old Econo Lodge off of Magnolia and I believe La Palma. Uh, that is now going to be Buena Esperanza and is going to have 69 permanent supportive housing units. And so we're processing additional people out of our shelter into permanent supportive housing. So we're kind of taking and opening that back door of our shelter and getting people now into permanent housing, which is amazing. And then our fourth goal is to regionalize this model. We just presented to the Orange County uh, Human Relations Commission today, as well as the Continuum of Care Board, as well as other cities that are interested in this type of model approach. Uh, so we're hoping to regionalize this so everybody's consistent across the county uh, and offering shelter and services and finding appropriate housing for everybody who's unsheltered. Currently, we have um, 426 shelter beds in Anaheim, uh, and again, close to 300 people in those shelters, so we still have beds available, and that was thanks to our city council approving additional 100 beds during COVID, and that really helped when we had to create social distancing in the shelter environment. And we've also now vaccinated everybody in the shelter, including our shelter staff, and we're going to be looking to take uh, and partner with CCRT and the county to actually vaccinate people that are unsheltered still on our streets to help slow that spread. Uh, we continue to help uh, do mental health assessments out there with our mental health clinician and medical assistance with our nurse practitioner, which is helpful. And then Andy Nagal and their team are working in the coming months and years on additional five to 600 additional permanent supportive housing units. And our last point in time count in 2019 was 694 people that were unsheltered on our street. So we're really pushing hard to start to create that project zero base where we have enough housing units for a, the unsheltered population on our streets. So a huge endeavor. We're six months in on our pilot, um, finishing up, and we're going to be doing a six month review before our city council and helps to continue the program through the end of the year and then hopefully get the program regionalized throughout the county. Uh, just on the code enforcement updates, I just, the only one I have is with the 
uh, state reopening, especially coming June 15th, but our resort opening a little bit sooner. We did offer a bunch of warnings uh, prior to our June 1st kickoff for enforcement on permit parking and all other parking. So uh, we are starting enforcement. We're still issuing some warnings here and there in some areas, but we are moving forward on parking enforcement uh, this month. Uh, we do balance our outreach program with our uh, enforcement, as Sergeant Lillamone said, but we use CCRT as our robust outreach system first. So we partner with Union Pacific on the railroad as well as Caltrans under the freeways and get people relocated before they do their cleanups. And so we had Caltrans out uh, this week at Ball and the 5 Freeway as well as the 57 in Lincoln and under the Big A, a little spot. And then next week, we're gonna be looking at 91 in the Brookhurst, 91 in Euclid and five in La Palma. And then Union Pacific is working this week at five in Magnolia, all the way down to Euclid and then also checking the Cerritos Catella area. So a lot of work being done uh, to help our homeless neighbors uh, in the coming months. We should have additional updates for you. For that, thank you. And I am completed with my presentation. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much, Sandra. If you need Spanish interpretation, please click on the globe icon located on the bottom right side of your screen. Si necesita servicios de interpretación al español, favor de oprimir el botón con la imagen del globo localizado en el lado derecho de su pantalla. Next, public work staff will provide us with information on the organic waste reduction legislation in California. So, solid Waste Administrator Dora Delgadillo will kick off the presentation. Thank you, Sandy, so much. First, I want to thank everyone for taking time of your busy schedule to join us for this very special meeting. The City of Anaheim has an extended team of professional solid waste consultants to help the city to meet legislation, bills, and laws. And today, we invited Lisa Robles with Economics she will be sharing information about a new recycling law. We also have Sandra Mark with the City of Anaheim Planning Department, as well as Kathy with Republic Services. They will be able to assist us with any questions that you might have on this presentation. So Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dora. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Robles. I'm a solid waste consultant and I work with the City of Anaheim in the Public Works Department with Dora and we assist the city in staying in compliance with um, solid waste and recycling mandates. So today we're gonna to be going over a recycling update and then I'm also going to be discussing a new recycling law coming to, um, into effect in 2022. Okay, so California has set some really important recycling goals. And the first one, the really main one here is um, the state of California wants to recycle or compost 75% of organic waste that, go, that goes to a landfill by 2025. Another one of their goals that they've set is to recover um, or rescue leftover edible food waste by 20% for people to eat. So um, you might be asking yourself, what is organic waste? So organic waste, is made up of three items. It's really anything that is living, or I should say, it's really anything that decomposes. So here, when we're talking about organic waste, we're talking about food waste, paper and cardboard, um, and then your yard waste as well. And the state of California is targeting organic waste specifically, um, because when we just think about food waste, California throws away about 5.6 million tons of food waste um, every year. And so I know the 5.6 million tons really doesn't sound a lot, uh, but in reality, when you compare it to a Boeing airplane, that's equivalent to 72,000 Boeing airplanes worth of organics going to the landfill per day. So this is how much organic waste that we are sending to the landfill, how much food waste, paper, cardboard, um, and your yard waste. And so what happens with all of those materials, when you throw it away at your home, the trash truck, 
uh, or the trash company, in this case, Republic Services, picks it up and then sends it to the landfill. And what happens is all of the organic material gets buried and um, doesn't get to naturally decompose. But what happens particularly at landfill sites is when all of that organic uh, material decomposes, it creates um, greenhouse gases, gases like carbon dioxide and methane um, gas. And these gas really contribute to, um, uh, to uh, warming of the planet, to climate change. And so this is why the state of California is really addressing organic waste. They wanna take that organic material out of the landfill um, to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then also just to um, extend the life of the landfills because we are running out of space um, in, in landfills here in Orange County. So what are, what are they doing to address all of the organic waste that we're sending to the landfill? Well, uh, the California Senate passed a bill called SB 1383. And this bill, um, you can also call it the Organic Waste Methane Law. Um, it addresses all of that uh, food waste. So um, we are going to start having to recycle and take out, take out, just recycle and divert food waste from the landfill. The law requires um, a, a lot of um, measures. And so one of them, there's actually quite a bit, but the main ones here are uh, the city is required by the law to provide yard waste and food waste services to all residents and businesses. Um, the SB 1383 also requires the city to actually adopt a local ordinance or a local law that enforces the state law. It also requires the city to develop programs um, such as inspection programs and compliance programs. Um, and again, establish an edible food recovery program for certain types of businesses, um, conduct public outreach. And the last one is um, impose penalties for non-compliance in 2024. So um, as part of this local ordinance or this local law, there has to be some kind of fine structure or penalty structure in place by 2024. So what does this mean um, for you as an individual in your home? Um, what it means is we're gonna start recycling our food waste at home. And so we anticipate this program starting sometime in 2022. And I say sometime in 2022 because we are still in the initial stages of planning the program. Um, and so what we imagine, again, this is subject to change, um, but what we imagine is your yard waste will become your organic waste cart at a house where you would mix your food waste with your yard waste. Your recycling would continue as is because you should already be recycling your paper and your cardboard in your recycling carts, placing them loosely in the cart, and then your trash cart will continue uh, the same as well. Um, make sure, making sure you're bagging all of your uh, trash waste, um, your styrofoam, your dirty tissues, or soiled napkins, sandwich bags, um, uh, chips and candy, wrappers, uh, pet waste, uh, greasy pizza boxes, boxes, those kinds of items. And so again, this is kind of um, the, the, we're in this init initial um, development. And so this is just kind of an example of what we think, uh, how the program might work. So this could change. SB 13.3 not only affects residents, but it also affects businesses. So businesses, there's actually some businesses already recycling food waste, um, and that's per another regulation targeted just particularly for businesses, and that one's called AB 1826. Um, what SB 13.3 does, though, it, it, it creates this um, enforcement mechanism and penalty mechanism. So businesses will have to start recycling, and they can start getting... Um, uh, find for if they don't have a program in 2024. Um, SB 1383 also requires schools and school districts to have a food waste recycling program or edible food donation program in place. Um, and again, this, uh, the businesses also, and there's only certain types of businesses, we're talking about the high generators of food waste that have to have a leftover edible food waste program. 
So what are we doing right now? So our next steps with SB 1383 as we prepare for it. Right now we're in the drafting mode of this local recycling law or a local ordinance. So we are drafting that right now. Uh, we're collaborating with the Holler Republic Services on how the services will work, what the services will look like and how those affect how um, those services will affect uh, rates. And then we're going to be continuing doing education and outreach. And so within the next uh, few months to the beginning of next year, you, hopefully you'll see some um, public outreach, social media campaigns. Um, you'll see a lot of articles in your Recycle Anaheim newsletters um, kind of pointing out the regulation. And then once the program gets started, letting you know how the program will get started. And so this is, um, so this is a new law, it's called SB 1383, um, and it kicks in in 2022. And so you'll see some changes coming um, next year, okay? Well, my name is Lisa Robles and I work for Economics Inc. And um, we assist Public Works with all of their solid waste and recycling needs. Thank you. Thank you, Dora and Lisa for that great information and hopefully we can work together to help spread the information the future. If you have any questions, please use our Q&A feature located at the bottom of the screen. Next, we have Community Investment Manager Andin Nagal, who will provide us with an update on the development at the Anaheim Boulevard and Mid -Drive, Midway Drive. Andy? Uh, it, sorry, Sandy, I'm trying to find the presentation. Uh, if you give me no one. Second here. Hmm. You know what, maybe you can help me. I'm not able to uh, pull it up, having some difficulties here. Yes, sure. I think we have your presentation and we can um, share it for you. Let me try one more time. Um, looks like it's loading. Okay. Andy, we have it set up. Yeah, you know what? Uh, why don't we just do that? Sorry, I'm having difficulty connecting it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Are we ready? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, everybody, for being here this evening. I appreciate the opportunity to present to you another great affordable housing project uh, by the name of Anaheim Midway Apartments. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Councilmember Valencia for his support and also the community. We did have uh, a couple of outreach meetings uh, with the neighborhood. Uh, in the surrounding area and received great input on this project. So uh, we've taken that information and uh, incorporated it into our project. Uh, we're uh, moving forward now uh, and uh, is scheduled to be considered by city council on June 22nd and the planning commission on June 21st. So uh, can you move the next slide please? Thank you. So for orientation, uh, the site is located uh, as outlined in the red. It's about a two acre site located at the southwest corner of Midway Drive and Anaheim Boulevard. Surrounding properties are an elementary school by the name of Paul Revere to the north on Midway. Um, to the west is an RV park and to the south is a mobile home park. Across Anaheim Boulevard is the uh, our commercial uh, properties. Next slide, please. This is the site plan for the proposed development. As, as I noted earlier, the site is located at the southwest corner of Midway and Anaheim. Uh, the site is a housing authority owned site that is approximately two acres and is proposed to be developed by a 100% affordable uh, workforce family project consisting of 86 units in one, two and three bedroom units. The site will provide uh, substantial amenities that would be available to the residents. One key uh, element that I, I wanna uh, discuss is there will be a space that uh, is unique to the site. Uh, we're calling it a flex space. And that flex space will be available for 
social services or activities that will benefit not just the development here or, or the residents that will live here in the future, but also the surrounding community. We wanted the developer to be a good neighbor and provide amenities that would not be a, not only be available for the residents living here in the future, but also for the surrounding community. Some of the amenities that will be proposed here will include a pool shown in the site plan, a, uh, a, uh, a dog run or dog park with a, 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 a dog cleaning area, uh, outside lounging area, a tot lot and a community garden. In addition, there'll be a deck uh, on top that's not shown here, but it, it's uh, identified where, where the club room is. That area will be available for outdoor lounging and also viewing of the fireworks uh, at Disneyland. Next slide, please. This is a, a better detail of the uh, amenities. As I indicated earlier, the, this is the area of the dog, uh, dog park. Uh, there will be a dog wash area, the pool, uh, a outdoor garden area, and the tot lot. This area here is an additional lounging area for the residents as well. Next slide, please. The design of the project will be in a contemporary architectural style. Uh, we always strive for uh, great architecture for the residents. Our view is that just because this is affordable doesn't mean that it shouldn't have high quality design uh, as market rate developments do. So this is gonna be a top notch architectural quality and great living environment for future low income families for Anaheim. Next slide, please. These are south and the west elevations. And that, as you can see, one key uh, factor that I want to identify is that all of the elements that you see are uh, surrounding all four elevations. We, ju we don't just address the streetscape of the, pro of the project. We look at overall the quality design throughout the elevations of the project. Next slide, please. And this is a rendering looking in a northwesterly direction towards the amenity area. As you can see, it, this is an attractive project. We're really excited about bringing this to Anaheim residents and District 4 and as soon as possible. If the, if the council approves the project on uh, June 22nd, we'll be submitting our application for funding on July 1st. Um, if that is successful, we're hoping to start construction on this project February of 2022. With that, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for that great presentation. And hopefully everything gets approved and it can be ready to go for that community. I know it's a, a huge need. Absolutely. Thank you. As we enter the summer season, Alexandra Solano with Anaheim Fire and Rescue is here to provide us with information about fire prevention and pool safety. Alexandra? Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Can you see me? Can't see myself. Yes, no. you okay, look great. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Alexander Solano with Anaheim Fire and Rescue, and as Sandy said, as we're getting into the summer season, you know, we have a lot of fun that we need to, that we are missing out on since last year, but we're going to start back up and enjoy ourselves. So this presentation is going to touch on smoke alarm safety and water safety. So next slide, please. This is one of our engines, engine seven. And as you can see the background, there's a fire going and this is gonna lead on to our topic as to why it's important to have working smoke alarms. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we wanna make sure that you are testing and replacing your smoke alarms monthly. So test your smoke alarm monthly, make sure that it works. If it keeps on beeping, you might need to replace the battery, but keep in mind that new smoke alarms have built-in um, batteries that last five to seven years. They have newer technology, so they're not as sensitive as the old ones. And plain and simply smoke alarms are not meant to last a lifetime. They should be replaced. We're also promoting here the beep where you sleep, and that's very important. If you don't have a smoke alarm inside your room, it's important that you install one in your in your in your room, in the hallway, and in the living room. So each room that someone's sleeping in should have a smoking a working smoke alarm. Um, the next thing we want to touch on is close before you doze and this is extremely important and we're going to show you why in the next couple of slides but you should always close your door before you go to sleep. Now we're going to go on to the smoke alarm program. Next slide please. Thank you. So we want to make sure that you are at least testing your smoke alarms once a month by pushing the button and make sure that it beeps. If it doesn't work Make sure that you replace your smoke alarm with the newer smoke alarms that 
are out there in the market that have a 10 year battery. So you're not having to do the change your clock, change your batteries, you know, anymore. We're promoting this type of uh, smoke alarm. It's better technology and you have a battery that lasts longer. Next alarm, I mean, next slide, please. So here's, um, here are the beep when you sleep. So if you have, um, let's see a two story house and you have a fire going on in their kitchen, it's gonna take a while for that smoke to travel all the way up to where you're sleeping. So we recommend that you have interconnected smoke alarms. They actually um, provide better protection because once one alarm is activated, all the alarms are activated. So everybody's alert that, hey, something's going on. We need to make sure that we investigate what's going on. So that's part of the hear the beep when you sleep. It'll automatically alert you to where, where there's a fire and you don't have to wait that you know, time before all the smoke starts traveling and activates your um, alarms in the second floor. Next alarm, next please. So here's the close the doors before you sleep. So as you can see the difference between somebody who didn't close door in a fire and a fire gets faster. It fire burns really fast. And nowadays we have so many synthetic materials and furniture and construction, so it automatically consumes it really, really fast. So research has proven that a door that is closed can be the difference between 1000 degrees and 100 degrees. And closing that door, having that door closed will give you the vital minutes that you need to make sure that you're getting out of your house. Next slide, please. So here we have um, our community engagement manager, Natalie, and she's showing you how about, about the smoke alarm program. So if you own a home, a town home, a mobile home in Anaheim, you can always call us at 765-4036 and we will provide you with free smoke alarms for your house. So the only caveat is that you have to be a homeowner, a condo owner, a town home owner, or a mobile home, and it has to be in Anaheim. And we will provide you one smoke alarm for every, every bedroom, one in the hallway and one in the living room. Next alarm, please. Thank you. So we want you to be prepared. And we want you to be um, prepared in case a fire does break out in your home. If you are prepared, then you know exactly what's going to happen next, and you're not going to be caught up and worried about what's going to happen next. So let's talk about having home uh, having a home escape plan. That's very important. We always think that it's never going to happen to us, but we need to talk to our family members and say, listen, if break, if for example, a fire were to break, what are we going to do? How do we escape out of this house? We have to make sure that people are aware that they need to know two ways out of every room. And generally you're sleeping with your door closed. Your exit is going to be your window. If your door is hot, for example, when you hear the beep, you're not gonna automatically go and open that door because guess what? That handle's hot and you're gonna burn yourself. So you're gonna try to make sure you're crawling low and slow up to the door and you're gonna feel with this part of your hand because this it's more callousy, so it doesn't feel the heat very well. This part is more sensitive. So you wanna feel for the door. If the door feels hot, you are never gonna open it. Then that's gonna be, you're gonna have to get your second way out, which is no two ways out of every room, whether you're in your bedroom, in the bathroom, in the living room, in the kitchen. It's always important to know what is gonna be my next exit because you don't know where fire is gonna start and where it might block you to you, for you to exit where you always think, I'm gonna exit the door, but maybe the door is not available. So we have to prepare for that. And if you live in a second story floor, make sure that you have a collapsible ladder that you can buy at Lowe's, Home Depot, um, I believe maybe Walmart has them. They're very easy. They store easily under your bed. You're able to mount it on your, on your second floor story and slowly make your way down. Now, once that happens, you have to identify also a meeting place. And this is very important because we might all come out of different areas from our house if it's burning and we're not always gonna be together. So we have to make sure that we say, hey, if we have an emergency, make sure that we need at Joe's house across the street. We wait for everybody to get there. You never, ever, ever go back into a burning building for any reason, not for your mom, your dad, a stuffed animal, a toy or a pet. You meet at your meeting place because that's where, we, that's where you're going to know that everybody knows where to meet. And if someone's missing, once we roll up, you let us know, hey, my mom still hasn't come out here. And we need to make sure that you give us that information so we know to look for her. We know that there's somebody that needs to be um, found quickly. 
And the most important thing is always practice because we can always talk about this, but if we don't practice and something were to happen, we're going to get into a panic. But the more we practice and the more we talk about it, the less fearful it would become. And it'll be like automatic mode. I know what to do. Next. So here we have a home escape plan. And as we talked about, we have, you know, the living room, the dining room, a couple of bedrooms, so a bathroom. So it's important to draw out your home and know exactly where your exit points are at because you never know where fires get, when fire is going to break out. You could be sleeping, you could be in the restroom, you could be in the living room, and then your natural um, exit pathway that you're used to could be blocked. And it's always good to think ahead. Make sure that um, sometimes, you know, we paint our windows shut without realizing it. So you got to practice and make sure your windows open. If not, you got to try to make sure that you are able to open it or get it unstuck. And if you can't, obviously you break the window because the ultimate goal here is to get you out of a burning building safely and fast. Next, please. Here we have the no two ways out. So find two ways out of every room in your home in case one exit is blocked or becomes too dangerous to use. Next slide. Thank you. And then the meeting place. Have an outside meeting place like a tree, a light pole, a mailbox that is a safe distance from, from where the house is at and where everybody should meet. And most importantly, please never ever go back into a burning building for any reason. Next, please. So again, practice, 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 always practice. Practice your home fire drill at night and during the day with everybody because obviously things are different at night. It's dark. And maybe the power might go out. So you have to, might have to feel yourself. But once you're practicing, you get more familiar with your plan, it's going to be a lot easier to implement and it's not going to be so hard to remember. So practice using the two ways out. Teach your children how to escape their house in case there is a fire and you might be outside or you might not be home. Practice getting out the window. That's a very good thing to uh, show them how to open the window. How are they going to get out of the, the window? where they're gonna go meet and stay in their meeting place. Next, please. <clears throat> now we're gonna to touch on water safety. Obviously, uh, summer has already not officially started, but you know, here we are always hot. It's always summer. So officially we, unofficially we started summer on Memorial Day. So we're gonna talk about water safety. Next, please. So did you know that drowning is the leading cause of unintentional death for children under the age of four? Teaching kids how to swim will reduce the risk of drowning by 88%. Next, please. We want to make sure that you uh, realize that nine out of 10 drownings occur when a caregiver is su supervising but not paying attention. So that make, means that we always think, oh, someone's watching and we don't really assign someone. We just assume somebody else is watching the pool, but it's important that we do assign someone that is watching the pool. Next slide, please. And to make that easy, we have the A through E's of water safety. So the first one is A, always have a designated adult water watcher. That is that their sole purpose is to simply just watch the water. They're not you know, busy with their phones or they're not taking phone calls or not reading a book and they're not drinking. They're simply, their job is to watch the pool to make sure that there's no trouble ahead while people are having fun. Be ready to call 911 in case of an emergency would be your B. Have a phone on site and know the address of the pool where you're at. The C would be CPR. CPR can save a life. So we encourage everybody to learn it. But, and here's the phone number for upcoming CPR classes. You may, can go to anaheim.net slash play or call 714-765-5191. Indeed, don't be distracted by poolside chats. It goes along with being a water watcher. Your sole job is to make sure you're watching the pool, your phone or other distractions. That's your main focus is these children and um, eyes. Make sure your sky eyes are scanning the pool left to right all the time because sometimes you could be distracted and just focus in on this side and you might have trouble on this side. So remember the A through E's of water safety so you can have a safe and fun summer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so here at Anaheim Fire and Rescue, we have a free water watcher kit that we give out to our homeowners that have pools or anybody that has a pool in their residence, just to make sure that it kind of homes in and brings home the message of what a water watcher should be doing during these times. So 
to help ensure that your children are safe in the pool, we have created this water watcher kit. And the kit includes um, a little card that has the tips that I just mentioned to you and it will help adults keep their eyes on the children. It has um, sunglasses, a little water watcher kit tip, a CPR card, a little whistle in case, you know, sometimes people get rowdy and you stop them from horsing around in the pool and a little lanyard that says you're a water watcher. So the most important thing is if you need a break or you have to go to the restroom that you assign somebody else to be a water watcher and not leave. And you take that lanyard, you put it on that person and that is their sole responsibility is to be watching that pool. If you're interested in one of these kits, please call us at 714-765-4036. Next slide, please. Oh, well, I guess I get a, I, I, get, I got ahead of myself in the water watcher, but let's, we have the lanyard. We have the sunglasses. We have a little bag, a little mesh bag to keep it on in place, a, C, a CPR card, a whistle, and some sunglasses. Next slide, please. And if you want to contact us for any of these programs or anything else, our website is www.anaheim.net slash fire. And our phone number is area code 714-765-4040. You may also contact us at our social media websites. Next slide, please. So you can follow us for more safety tips and also get in touch with us if you need to, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Next slide. And I do believe that's it for us. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them live or under the question and answer chat. Thank you, Alexa, for those helpful tips. As a reminder, the Community Service Department partners with the YMCA to offer swim lessons for all of our residents. And it's a great information since Alexandra just mentioned the importance of learning how to swim and being a water watcher. So please visit our website for more information on swim classes. Next, we have our principal project planner, JJ Jimenez, who will provide us with information about the capital improvement updates for this area. JJ, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sandy. And so I'm going to utilize our capital improvement website to um, sort of um, give you an idea of the things that we're working on, provide brief highlights on a couple of projects, and then um, you know, share it with you so that you can go back and um, get more details on the projects that I'm going to share with you and then other projects that we're working on. So here I go. And so the website is anaheim.net backslash um, park projects. And so here you'll, um, you, as you scroll through it, you'll find different tabs. And so we have organized our projects uh, based on the uh, current status. And so we have three different tabs. One is called uh, design. And these are things that um, are either very conceptual or we're just still putting the plans together. Potentially we are, we are under community input process. And so uh, as noted here, just in the design stage, um, as things transition from design and plan check and permitting um, to construction, then you can hop over to the uh, under construction tab and then see some things that, uh, that we're working on. Uh, for instance, I'll take the opportunity here to just give you an update on the project shown here on the screen. And this is the Ponderosa San June Medical Health Clinic. And I just want to share with you that um, a few years ago, the city was approached and successfully partnered with San June Medical Services to uh, develop and install a medical clinic here at Ponderosa Park. And it's going to be a 5,000 square foot building that will be offering um, all the uh, types of uh, medical services that you might imagine, including um, um, medical, vision, and dental. And so with this, we're super excited because it really complements this idea that we have of a campus or campus um, offerings for the residents. So here's um, some of the progress photos and when I mean, what I mean by campus offerings. So our residents at Ponderosa area can now, will now be able to uh, seek and find medical uh, services. We also have the Family um, Resource Center at, at this site. We have a public library, um, you know, the Ponderosa Elementary School is on site. And of course, our park is there as well. Here, if I'm, going, I'm just going to, again, show you uh, the, uh, a couple more shots and you, uh, you can learn about more projects here as well. And I'm going to uh, move over to the recently completed and uh, uh, tab and take the opportunity to just talk to you about um, 
our partners at the YMCA and the great complex that they have developed as noted here at 1422 West Broadway. It is adjacent to Ross Park. And we are just super excited that they have been able to develop the first uh, speed door or indoor soccer arenas um, that, that, that they're going to be uh, opening up and uh, being utilized by our residents. Um, the the uh, community complex, in addition to active sports like speed soccer and futsal, um, it's also being used creatively for other types of um, non or more passive type um, activities. This include um, offerings by the Y and their partners, um, such things as yoga. They also offer um, adult um, boot camp um, and other types of um, kickboxing, kickboxing and other uh, such activities. They also uh, partner with various organizations to do um, um, different programming here as well. For instance, about a week ago or so, um, they partnered with um, with the Red Cross and they had a blood drive here as well. So lots and lots of uh, cool activities coming to this complex, lots of offerings. And if I would encourage you to visit their website, anaheimymca.org, uh, and they have a full um, gamma there of information. And if you want to uh, know about their operating hours, the different pro programs that they offer and that sort of thing. So um, lastly, I am going to go back to the, um, sorry to make you guys dizzy here, but I'm going to go back to the under the sign tab just to share with you an update on one of our other projects. Um, and this will be what we're calling Center Greens. And let me find it here. Sorry, here we go. Okay. So here on the screen, you see the site plan. And just for your information, Again, as you scroll through this website, you'll find more details, but this space is located just east of uh, our city hall and then um, generally between the um, downtown uh, community center in the north and then the youth center here in the south. And so this site is going to be seeing lots and lots of improvements, which we have partnered with the adjacent residents to de uh, determine what they wanted to see. And so things that they have told us that they really want to see at this site are, um, a covered um, community plaza so that, um, you know, um, the, the seniors that you generally use this area every day to exercise, but, you know, they talk to us about how during rain events or when it's super sunny, it's, it's not ideal. And so they asked for a um, covered area. And also um, the community talked to us about, you know, having potential celebrations there under this space when it's not being util utilized for exercise and so on and so forth. It was also very important to the community that we create a walking path um, around the entire site for exercise. And so, um, so if you guys are familiar with this site here on the, um, between the downtown community center and the youth center, there is already exercise equipment. And so, um, you know, the walking path just really complements that. Um, and then um, just a little more details on what is coming to this site. Um, on the south area, um, you're gonna see a lot of activation and so um, there's already a skate park and a, a basketball court, but both of those will be upgraded and somewhat relocated. But then we're also going to be installing a um, play area and um, what we're calling a uh, youth challenge course or what you might be more familiar with um, as, as American Ninja Warrior type equipment. And so let's see, um, for this site, um, as noted on this tab, we are under design. Um, you know, we're also uh, in, um, in the funding, um, uh, putting together the funding uh, mechanisms to, to accomplish this project. And we, uh, we hope to start construction uh, next summer for this project. So Sandy, with that, um, I, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it at that um, and invite everyone to go back and visit our website. And I'll note it again as anaheim.net backslash um, capital or, or rather parks projects. And uh, with that, um, I will uh, answer any questions that anybody may have. Thank you, JJ. Those are great projects coming up. Now we have senior planner Elaine Timper City who will update us on the C3 story map tool. Elaine, take it away. Thank you, Sandy. Again, I'm Elaine Timper City. I'm with the planning and building department and I've been working on a project called the Center City Corridor Specific Plan. 
And Jason, if you could please share your screen and pull up the website. Uh, what I'm here to share with you tonight, I actually was here at the last meeting giving an update on the project, but today um, what I wanted to share was a, spe a special website that we've created that's dedicated to providing information about the project in a very um, quick and easy to follow format, as well as a mechanism for the community to um, give some feedback to us. So the website of the page that you're looking at now, and this is for our story map site, is www.c3storymap.com. And the information that you're going to find on this site is going to be very helpful, especially for those of you who may not already be familiar with the project. We do have an official uh, project website on the Anaheim.net website, and there's all kinds of information on there regarding all of the public meetings that we've had, and includes video recordings as well as um, PDFs of the presentations, uh, but it is a lot of information. So the purpose of this site, um, if you look at the tabs on the top, are to share information that we have um, we've shared with the community stakeholder group and basically recommendations that we would like to move forward in, in crafting the specific plan. And we want to hear your feedback. So the tabs that are, I think are going to be most important to you once you, you know, learn a bit about the background of the project is the tab called interactive map survey. And another term for this interactive survey is social pinpoint, which some of you might be familiar with um, from when the city was doing the Anaheim First project. Uh, but the way that it works is on the left side of the screen, there are different buttons that you could press uh, that pertain to different topic areas. For instance, there's streetscape. So if you were to click on that, you would see on the map that um, different um, icons are represented there that include comments from users like you who might have comments on specific areas of the city. And you can also, so you that way you could read other people's comments and you could either agree or disagree. And at the end of um, the survey period, uh, city staff will collect all of this information and just review the feedback and make changes accordingly to our recommendations. So this survey um, is going to be available through the entire months of June and July. So this will, um, the site will be active. You'll be able to come back to it and look at other comments that might have been posted um, and add more as you think of them. Um, also, just to the right of that tab, there's one called general survey. And this is sort of a more typical survey monkey type of thing where um, what we're looking for here is um, prioritization and answering questions that are going to help us in the next step of analysis we're going to be doing um, when we're looking at types of uses and um, design details and things like that. So we're interested in seeing what is most important to the community um, as well as any other suggestions. There are a lot of um, categories where you could um, fill in the blank and put in your own responses as opposed to the ones that we've already populated. So again, um, the website is uh, www.c3storymap.com. And this website, again, will be live through the months of June and July. So we hope that you uh, will check out the site and give us some feedback. And also, if you haven't already, you can go to the city's website to sign up for updates. And that website is anaheim.net slash C3. And on that site, you could um, sign up for um, email updates so that whenever we have community meetings, um, I always um, send an email to those in our distribution list. And of course, we also post to social media whenever we're going to have um, a public meeting. So that's what I wanted to share today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Elaine. I um, currently don't see any more questions, but if anybody does have any questions that were not answered during the meeting or have further questions, please send me an email at, es at san espantoja.nheim.net and we will also be attaching the questions and answers on our Neighborhood Services website at anaheim.net slash neighborhoods, along with the contact information of tonight's presenters and the video recording. Before we conclude the meeting, I do have a few announcements. The Anaheim Public Art Master Plan will create a roadmap for how we begin to activate our many communities to implement and enjoy public art while also celebrating Anaheim spirits and artistic expressions. 
More information about the Public Art Plan initiative can be found at www.anaheimpublicart.org. So how can you get involved? Anyone who lives, works, or interests in the city of Anaheim is encouraged to be involved in shaping the Public Art Master Plan. Here's how to do it. Tell us about your neighborhood by taking the community character survey. This is a very important to our process, so please take a moment to fill it out today if you have a moment. Give creative feedback by submitting an idea or image of what Anaheim interests unique or a great place to call home. Please take the project survey to share your ideas and visions for the public art in Anaheim. You'll also notice special treasure hunts for each district listed on the website that you can participate in. Get, get outside and explore your neighborhood as we celebrate Anaheim's treasures with a months long treasure hunt sponsored by the Community Service Public Art Master Plan effort. Locate each treasure within your district and take a selfie. Submit one selfie with your favorite treasure and take the Public Art Master Plan survey for a chance to win one of six treasure chests filled with swag from local businesses. All of the surveys and information about the Public Art Plan Initiative can be found at www.anaheimpublicart.org. Next, the city manager is working on a great initiative, the city mission statement. The city manager's office will soon be working with the community to get input on what's important to Anaheim's residents and stakeholders, what should be included in the city mission statement and values. You will be seeing more information coming soon, so please keep an eye out for information. And I don't see any questions, and like I said, uh, please email me. Um, in closing, I would like to invite you to visit our Neighborhood Services website at anaheim.net slash neighborhoods or call us at 714-765-4456 to learn more about our services and how we can work together to improve your neighborhood. Before I adjourn the meeting, I would, I would like to thank all of our attendees and panelists this evening for your time and commitment to our city. Thank you for joining us and have a good evening. Goodbye.